Hi, everybody, and, and welcome back to part two for a deep dive on data internals. Uh, forgive me, I'm a little bit under the weather today, so hopefully my, my voice holds out all the way through this presentation. I'm going to pick up exactly where we left off on our previous presentation. Uh, previously, we had made it through data internals for a record, and we were going to go next to pages. So we're going to pick up right here on the same spot of our slide deck. Uh, I've got a lot of information and a lot of uh, of demos, hopefully, that will make internals applicable to the real world. So we're going to try and hit the ground running with this right away. Now, as a reminder, uh, my name is Bradley Ball. Uh, I'm SQL Balls on Twitter. Uh, my email address, and let me show this one more time before we dive into it. Uh, typically, I'll do an introduction slide. And this is me. These are some ways you can get in contact with me if you have any questions after. Um, I appreciate the emails that I got last time as well. Uh, bball at pragmaticworks.com. Always a great way to get in touch with me. Depending on how busy my day is will depend on, on how quick I can get an email back to you. Uh, but I promise you I, I will respond. And uh, uh, some of the cool things I've done, my experience. But if you were here for part one, uh, then let's go ahead and dive all the way right on to part two. As you recall, what we've been discussing is the way that we learn backwards. And as you can see by the slides that I'm, I'm passing by right now, we covered a lot. This deck is currently on my website. If you go to sequelballs.com, my resource page, you can grab it. And uh, we've already got the presentation from this Tuesday up and online. So please feel free to go and grab that and, and begin streaming that if you missed anything on record internals. So to pick up from pages, uh, we started our data hard hour at the very bottom we've got records, our next step up is pages. When we look at the anatomy of a page, um, the way that a page is put together is it is 8,192 bytes um, and 90, the first 96 bytes are our page header. Inside of our page header, we have a lot of metadata specific to our page. As you can see, I've got a little excerpt in there in yellow. Uh, you can see, for example, one of the things I have highlighted is M3 data. This points to the next location on a page where our next data record would get inserted. And this is important because later we're going to talk a little bit about latches, and you'll see how M3 data and page metadata correspond directly to latches within SQL Server. Inside of our page, we have 8,090 bytes that we can actually store data on and also have our slot array. Our slot array is a zero-based array that records the number of records on a page. When we use DBCC page uh, and we go and we look at the data on a page, one of the quickest ways to be able to tell how many records you have on a page is you can either look at the slot count, the M slot count up at the top, and you can see for this instance I only have three slots, and this page only had three slots on it as well, or you could scroll all the way down the bottom. As a zero-based array, our first record is going to be zero. We add plus one to that, and you'll be able to figure out how many slots that you actually have on a page. This is important because our data records could actually be pushed in a different order uh, than what we would believe them to be based off our clustered index key, uh, based off of the way that we think they might be located on the page. Or base, it's going to be basically based on insert ratio if it's a heap. The slot will actually point to that space within these 8,096 bytes that shows us specifically where we can get the data as we're looking for it. There are a lot of different types of pages. The most common type we're going to find is a data page, and that's what we were looking at previously. When we look at DBCC IND previously, we were looking at page types. Page type 1 was a data page. Page type 2 is an index page. And you can see right here, that's the second one on our list. Whenever you create an index, a clustered index or non-clustered index, you're going to get type 2 index pages. In a non-clustered index, every single page will be an index page. A non-clustered index will have leaf pages down at the very bottom, the zero level of an index. This is going to be where the actual data for a non-clustered index is stored. If you put any uh, include columns on, on your leaf level of your pages, uh, those will be on index pages for your non-clustered indexes. Any non-leaf level pages would be our intermediate level and also our root level for indexes. Uh, all pages that are above level zero, essentially. The next type of page we have is a text page. Now remember, we were talking about records. 
and records have different allocation units for where they are stored. Uh, anything that is 4,000 characters or higher that cannot fit on a regular data page is going to be on a text record, either as a lob data or a slob data page. Uh, slob data is also known as row overflow data, lob data is large object data. And these are going to be in a text tree format. We'll have a 24 byte pointer in our regular data record that points to these pages to be able to get these larger text records. But this is how we can associate, say, a 2 gigabyte by far binary or a 2 gigabyte uh, var char max field with a regular data record uh, that, that we've got on our data pages. We also have sort pages. Sort pages are created in TempDD, typically when we have an order by operation or if we have a merge join operation. We could have a spill to disk, which will be identified in our query execution plan, and it will let us know that we have a spill operation. Sort is going to be, uh, sort pages are created whenever we have to order something though, and it's not physically ordered that way on disk. For example, if we've got a student table, and we've got a student ID as our primary key, if we decide we want to select all from students and we want to order by their birth date, or we want to order by their first name, last name, or last name, first name, we're going to need sort pages created to be able to take that data, sort it in a particular order before the storage engine can hand it back to our relational engine. We have a boot page. Boot page is always page nine in every single database. Uh, this is where when your database first comes online and it boots up, uh, a lot of the metadata is stored on boot nine of the page. As a matter of fact, in transparent data encryption, uh, we actually have this in the file header, page one of the page, uh, which is a thumbprint to be able to check that the database has the proper encryption key. So our file header page is page one, and that page is always loaded up first. And it's a very important page because, again, if you're using transparent data encryption, this is where we check that header to make sure that we've got the matching thumbprint certificate to be able to decrypt the file. Allocation pages. We have GAM pages, SGAM pages, PFS pages, diff map, ML map, and ML map, and IAM pages. And we're going to go into those just a bit more in a moment. So next up, because we've covered pages, the important thing about pages is understanding the different types of pages that we have in our database. The structure is going to be relatively the same until you start getting into non-leaf level index pages or you start getting into uh, text tree maps for blob and log data. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a demo on reading pages, but we're also going to talk about why it matters. So this is a, for the sake of time and to make sure we get through everything today, I'm just going to skip over this one. This is, uh, this is a demo essentially just to let you know that all the pages are in order in the way that we normally would look at them. Uh, we've got our boot record page that we discussed, our file header page is page zero, I'm sorry, it's page one. And you can take a look at DBCC page demo internals. Oh, and I forgot to put trace flag 3604 on. And as you can see, when, what we mentioned yesterday, if you don't put 3604 on, you just get executed. Uh, you get the message that the command executed safely, but it did not give us any output. Uh, you can also do a DBCC page table only results. Uh, in this case, though, I, I prefer to go out to the messages. So if we look at our header page, you can see here's all this wonderful metadata operations and once again I forgot to put on zoom it sorry about that and you can see right here that we've got our file group our group our, our LSN if I had an encryption key the thumbprint would be stored in here as well but I'll let you guys look through each one of these and I've got these labeled out as GAN pages PFS pages uh, the diff map, the ML map, and when we talk about allocation bitmaps in a moment, we'll talk about these a bit more in depth. But why does it matter when we get to pages? Why do pages matter uh, when we look at our internals for SQL Server? Well, there's a lot of reasons that pages actually matter, but one of the most clear cut is corruption. So I've got a database right here, and it's a corrupt database that I edited with the hex editor to automatically force us to get a corrupt check, and I just called it corrupt adventure. So if I do a DCC uh, check DB for corrupt adventure, you can see that the query completed with errors right down here. 
Whenever you do a DBCC Check TV and you get a result like this, this is never a good sign. So what you want to do is you want to scroll down until you find red. And here we go. I can see right here by the red that here's my index ID, my object ID, and I had a problem with a page. Now what I can also tell right away, and I'm not going to try and spoil this too much, but because the index ID is 5, we know that this is a non-clustered index. You can see that we had a problem processing this page. We had a buffer error, or a BSTAT error, and when we take a look at this, we can see that it was a problem with this parent referring to a child member. So let's dig in this a little bit more, because we have our object ID, and what we can do is grab this object ID from our message, and I've already got it plugged in, but just to show you guys right here. And then we can do a select all from sys objects to be able to determine what the object is that we got that was corrupt. And it would help if I was actually in my corrupt database. And I can see fact internet cells has been corrupted in this particular instance. Now because I know it's ID5 and it's a non-clustered index, what I can do is I can select all from sys indexes where index ID5 is. And I can see that it's index fact internet cells. Now, when we did our DBCC check DB, we got a specific error for a specific page. But another way that we could find this information is we could go to our MSDB DBO suspect pages table. You definitely want to have an alert set up on this table. If I ever get an entry in this table, this is something I want to know about. SQL Server will log the fact that it tried to read a page, the page was corrupt, and we could not get to it. In this case, page 3,874 is corrupt. For database 38, and if we did a select all from sys databases, we can find that database ID 38 is a corrupt adventure. So if we want to, we could try and do a DBCC on that page. Let's do that real quick. A severe error occurred on the command. The results, if any, should be discarded. Well, that makes sense because it's corrupt. We, we can't get to this page. And as a matter of fact, if we take a look at Fact Internet Cells on Corrupt Adventure, and we take a look at that index, we can see that it's specifically on the order key. Make this a little bit wider so we can see it. And here's our index right here. Now, Let's go ahead and do a select just from order date. And what we'll find is at some point in time we're going to get an error. We had a logical consistency I.O. error based on an incorrect checksum. And it occurred reading this particular page. It gives us the file path, a whole bunch of useful information. Now I would never wish corruption on any of you, but if you were ever to get corruption, the best type of corruption to get is non-clustered index corruption because what you do is you drop your non-clustered index and you recreate it. And that's exactly what we'll do. And then we'll do a DBCC check DB for corrupt adventure. And we see that this time our check came back just fine with an ice cream checkbox. Now the reason that pages are very, very important is when you do get corruption on a particular page, you need to understand what type of page it is what object that's located to and how it's tied to it, and more importantly, whether it's a data page, whether it's a non-clustered index page, and then taking a look at the pages that are used in that object, you can actually determine if it was an index level page, what your course of action might be to be able to, get, to take care of that. Uh, in some cases, if you have backups handy and data hasn't changed much, you can do uh, uh, online page restore if you have enterprise edition. A lot of different ways you can battle corruption, but the most important thing that we're going to do with pages is we're going to understand what the physical layout is. So the next thing we're going to hop up to is extents. The big thing to remember with extents is extents are a concept that was made up so that way we could track the allocation of records. We have two, we have two different types of extents. We have mixed extents and dedicated extents. 
Mixed extents use the first eight pages. Uh, I'm sorry, dedicate. They allocate one page uh, at a time for the first eight pages that are allocated. A mixed extent example would be if you create a very small table, you create, you get allocated one page at a time. Uh, mixed extents are also come from our SCAM pages. Uh, this is part of the reason that you used to see a lot of SCAM contention within SQL Server in, 2000, uh, in SQL 2000. Uh, there were some optimizations done to the way that um, that we allocate temp uh, tables and temp DB, uh, which help us somewhat with mixed extents, but we still see a lot of SCAM contention. One thing you can do is you can turn on a particular trace flag to be able to get rid of mixed extents. Mixed extents are a throwback to the point in time where disks were very expensive and we didn't have a lot of disk space on hand. Uh, so the allocations were one page at a time. Dedicated extents occur after the first eight pages of the table are allocated. And a dedicated extent means that we will dedicate one full extent to an object. You could have multiple objects utilizing an extent, a mixed extent. You could also have the first eight pages of your table belonging to multiple different extents if you allocated that data very, very slowly or if you had a lot of contention going on on your server. Dedicated extents at least offer up the ability for us to dedicate entire extents to objects and they're more efficient than mixed extents. Uh, dedicated extents will be granted to you via GAM pages. So when we look at contention, we look at page two, which is a GAM page, and we look at page three, which, an, which is an SGAM page. The way extents are allocated are directly related to the contention that we'll see within TempTV. When we start looking at allocation bitmaps, the first one we really want to look at is a PFS page. A PFS page tracks the allocated free space within SQL Server. Uh, it's always going to, uh, to be the same page and we get a new page every 8,088 pages. We can store roughly 64 megabytes on, uh, or there's a PFS page can track roughly 64 megabytes worth of storage. One of the things to keep in mind is that our GAM pages are actually allocated around every four gigabytes. They track one byte per page, whereas with, I'm sorry, one bit per page, whereas with PFS page, we actually track a full byte per page. The byte per page for a PFS page gives us eight different bits to be able to track the different state of that page because we have a lot more that we need to monitor with a PFS page. So for example, if we break down the bits in a PFS page, zero through seven, because we do it on a zero based array, the first page is allocated, uh, so it tells us the pages, whether the extent is allocated or not. The second bit on a PFS page tells us whether the page is a mixed allocation page or a dedicated allocation page. The third uh, bit tells us whether or not it's an IAM page. The fourth bit tells us whether the page has ghosted rows. And bits five, six, and seven are used to be able to tell us what the free space is on a page. The free space is calculated by if they're all the zeros, the page is empty. 001 is the page is 1 to 50 percent full. 010 is the page is 51 to 80 percent full. 011 is 81 to 95 percent full. And 100 is the page is 96 to 100 percent full. Whenever we have to allocate an object to a page, we have to check a PFS page. So PFS pages are very important for us to understand. If we see contention on page one, I'm sorry, I said that the database file header was page one, it's page zero. Uh, if we see allocation contention on page one, then we know we have PFS page contention. When we look at our GAM pages, the GAM to global allocation map, as we discussed, tracks dedicated extents with one bit per extent. It's always page two. The SGAM is page three, which will track mixed extents. Remember, uh, these pages, like I said, it's about four gigabytes that we can track per single 8-bit GAM and SGAM. Uh, and that works out to be about 5,500 and 11,230 pages. So those GAMs are very, very important when it comes to everyday objects and the way that we actually allocate our data within SQL Server. Our differential map is our last change bitmap. This tracks a byte per page in an extent 
to be able to determine how many pages have changed since our last full backup. And this is page six in the database. And once again, this is allocated in the same method. Uh, we get one differential map per four gigabytes within our database. So the number of diff differential maps will directly correspond to the size of your database. But if you've ever wondered how we get differential backups, this is exactly how. We go to the differential map, we track all the bits that have changed from the last full backup, and we understand what pages need to be part of that differential backup. Similarly, an ML map traps our minimally logged backups and our changed bitmaps for our transaction logs. So whenever we back up a transaction log for our databases in bulk logged or full recovery, we're specifically doing that so that way we can find the pages that have changed during this last period of time. So it's very important to understand the concepts of the diff map and ML map because they directly relate to the backups and how our backups work within SQL Server. At the top of our heap, we have IAM, chain, IAM chains and allocation units and allocation bitmaps. The two of these work synonymously with each other, but they are completely different pages and concepts that I want us to understand. An IAM page is an index allocation map, and it's always page 8 within our database. Uh, when we do a DBCC IMD, what we're doing is we're looking at an object, at all the IAM pages that are associated with that object, and we're transversing them to be able to see all the pages that are dedicated to a particular object. That's how we can find our index pages, our non-leaf pages, um, our data level pages when we look at an object. It's a bitmap that is allocated in the same way that an SGAM and a GAM is, uh, but the header is a bit different. Uh, it's a single slot array and it, it stores mixed extents, I'm sorry, mixed extents are dedicated for IAM page. That's a very important concept because even if we turn off mixed page allocations, IAM pages are still allocated by SGAM pages every single time. There's a sequencing number for an IAM page that makes up an IAM chain, and this is the linkage that we transfer from DBCC IMD. So when we look at SQL Server and we look at creating a new table, the steps that we have to follow as they fire off internally uh, are around this, this methodology. First, we, we have our database already, and we say, I want to create a table. We're going to go to an SCAM, and that SCAM is going to allocate our IAM page. Our IAM page will then go and mark an entry into a PFS page for tracking the space for that IAM page. The PFS page will also have an entry within the SCAM for itself. We have under the cover system allocation tables that will begin tracking what we're actually allocating. Our table will be created and we'll get an entry in some syspages tables underneath this, the covers. Uh, if we use a clustered index, there's multiple tables including sysindexes tables that will be updated. And we make our, we create our very first data page. That data page also has to have an entry for it on the PFS page also has to have an entry for it on an IAM page and also has to have an entry on an SCAM page. And every time we allocate a new data page, we have to have a new SCAM, PFS, and IAM allocation. And this will occur for our first eight pages. And after we get to eight pages, we begin doing dedicated extents where we allocate a full extent at a time via a GAM. You can use trace flag 1118 to turn off mixed page allocations. Uh, it's one of the startup pages that I, I automatically recommend to most people. If you don't have this on by default, there's no reason that you should not. And just to keep in mind that IAM pages are always allocated by SCAM pages. So why does this matter? One of the big reasons to really understand the way that allocations work is because of our TempDB contention. When we look at contention within TempDB, what we're looking for is do we have PFS, um, GAM, or SGAM contention. So the next demo that I have for you has, has a little bit of work to go together. 
So Jason Strait put together a really great uh, script that I like to utilize, and it creates really good latch contention within TimTB. But I'm running on SSD, so one set of queries running isn't quite enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to create another uh, stored proc that will create separate latch contention, uh, and hopefully some DDL contention as well, so that way we can track that within our SQL Server. So I'm going to open up both of these, and my first one I'm going to run, and you can see I'm just going to create a temporary object. I'm going to have a range that I create, uh, and I'm going to select from my database log a range of IDs, create a unique, a unique index, and drop table. And of course, you guys would never have SQL that does something like this. This creates a, a temp table, throws an index on it, selects from it, drops it. JSON's is, is going to create an, a temp table, uh, update all that data in the temp table, select from that temp table, and, and then drop that temp table. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a script to be able to track our contention. Uh, Robert Davis was the first person that I saw use this script. And I, I grabbed this a long time ago, and I'm sorry I don't have a URL link to the, the blog that I grabbed it in. But what we're doing is we're taking a look at system OS waiting task, and we're taking a look at the resource description to see if it's divisible by one, two, or three. Remember, one is going to be our PFS page, two will be our GAM page, three will be our SGAM page. And then we're also going to take a look for DDL contention within TempDB to see if we have any page latch operations going on where the read source description is like to. So to fire off these scripts, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the SQL load generator tool to execute JSON's SQL what if 50. I'm going to do five threads, and we'll see how uh, my server fares. Hopefully I don't stress the uh, laptop so hard that the, that the communication gets choppy from me. And then I'm also going to create 50 command windows, which will run my other two. You can see that here's my windows right here. My CPU is spiking pretty high, and now let's fire off Jason's, and let's come and look at our TempDB. Well, I can see I'm getting, there we go, I'm getting some good DDL, and I'm getting contention within the TempDB itself. So you can see page type 1, that's my PFS page, page type 2, that's my GAM page. I don't have any page type 3 contention. But one of the big things to take a look at is when you have contention like this occurring, you then want to understand what process is actually forcing your contention. Because often it's things that we can fix. For example, I'm using TempDB too heavy at this point in time. That's very obvious. If I can find the processes that are running and they're tied to a storage procedure, then what I can do is I can track down that storage procedure, take a look at how I'm utilizing my TempDB, and I can figure out a better way to actually write these stored procs. And we're not going to go into that uh, with this presentation today, but this is why GAM contention is important. Understanding our pages for SQL Server and also how they're allocated. Because the way they're allocated applies specifically not only to the tables that we create, but also for all of our temporary objects. We have to create these objects underneath the covers on SQL Server, and if we do them in a very inefficient manner, manner or we overutilize them, then it could cause us issues. This is another reason why we take TempDB and we create one file per physical core up to eight that's in a SQL Server. Bob Ward did a great presentation at the PASS Summit back in 2011, and uh, he's definitely an authority I would follow on this. Bob said never create more than eight unless you've got a very, very specific situation, and at that point in time, you're probably looking at a very deep dive situation with TempDB. Typically, you'll never need more than eight, but I like to do one per logical core. And the reason we would do that is each of those physical files has their own set of GAM pages to be able to, tra tra uh, to track files. So you'll get a separate IAM page, you'll get a separate GAM page, 
uh, an SCAN page per physical file in TempDB. So the reason in TempDB you create multiple files is to help alleviate contention like this. Right now I have my TempDB sitting on an SSD, but I only have one file for this particular instance. And as you can see, I have four physical cores. What I would do is I would probably go and make four physical files and see if I could allocate the, the busyness of my system a bit better. I'd also look at those statements, and of course those statements are doing a lot of things in TempDB that I could probably figure out how to do other places, or I could make more efficient. But this is why TempDB and GAMS matter, um, I'm sorry, GAM allocation, page allocation, and pages matter within SQL Server internals, because it helps us to be able to identify problems and zero in on how we would want to, uh, to have a solution. Because once we understand what's actually going wrong, it's pretty easy for us to turn around and say, okay, well, we've, we've got contention going on. We need to get rid of that contention. Killed my command windows. Let me go ahead and stop this process from running. You can see my CPU utilization goes back down nicely. So. Next up, we're going to look a little more specifically at IAM chains and allocation units. Allocation units are made up of three different types, in-row data, row overflow data, and log data. In-row data is going to be the physical data pages that we've been looking at all along. There are type 1 pages. Uh, they're also known as hobbits, which is why we have the nice little Lord of the Rings picture there. They're also known as heaps and v-trees. Only data on in-row data compresses, and this is very, very important. Row overflow data is slob or small object. These are our char fields, which are more than 4,000 bytes, but less than 8,000 bytes that have somehow fallen off of our in-row data, but allow us to have rows that are larger than 8,060 bytes. Our lob data is going to be our large object fields, a bar binary max, uh, image field, text field. These are all lob data types. A bar char max is actually a tricky little field. Bar char max will start off as in-row data and will actually, as it grows large enough, either be pushed over to row overflow data or will be pushed all the way over to lob data. So one of the things to keep in mind with the way that we have allocation units is this is allowed SQL Server to scale from our releases. Uh, allocation units, uh, the row overflow and data type to allow us to be able to extend fields was introduced in SQL Server 2005. If you go back to SQL 2000, we had log data and we had in-row data, but we didn't have row overflow data. If you take a look at your tables, one important thing to keep in mind is each one of them has its own set of allocation units. Every single table and object will have in-row, log, and slot data. That can be associated with it. Each index or um, whether it be a clustered index, I'm sorry, each index, uh, if it's a non-clustered index, I should really turn this key to gray, will have its own set of allocation units. A uh, clustered index is your base table, so it will automatically have the three allocation units. You don't get an extra set by putting a clustered index on there. A non-clustered index, though, will have its own set of allocation units, an additional three. And tables by partition get their own set of allocation units. And if you put an index across multiple partitions, you can actually have more allocation units associated to those indexes. This is very important because this allows our data to be able to scale. Uh, this was an important introduction for us to be able to utilize partitioning and to really have very large database systems in SQL Server where underneath the covers and using metadata, we could allocate all this. So how do allocation units matter? One of my favorite places for allocation units is compression. So when we take a look at allocation units, first off, it's not easy to always uh, create row overflow data. Uh, row overflow data is something that generally happens after you've grown variable length data. So in this example, I'm going to make a table that wouldn't really compress very well. We're going to create an identity key that's a primary key clustered index, uh, two different fields, which are varchar 8000s, a varchar max, and a text. 
We're going to insult, insert a bunch of default data values, about 5,000 of them. And when we come down and we do a DBCC IND, we'll be able to see that we've got our in-row data, our type 1 pages, and there's a type 2 for a level 1 uh, for our clustered index. And you can see that we've got another IAM page, which is associated for our next set of allocation units for our log data, data or our type 3 pages. Now, there's a better way to be able to track this data and take a look at it. Using sysindexes and sysPartitions, we can actually get every single table, every single index key, and whether it has in-row data, row overflow data, or log data. This is one of the scripts that I use quite a bit whenever I'm looking at compressing objects because the first thing I want to find is something like a loop table that I've got right here where I've got a lot of in-row data and I don't have any log data whatsoever. So let's go ahead and make some slob data appear. What we're going to do is we're going to take those varchar values, those varchar 8000s, we're going to extend both of them. and We're just going to do a loop where we update 500 values. We look at our data again we can see that my table one has 563 in-row pages, 501 row overflow pages, and 65 lob pages. And where this can matter for us using demo and turtles, I'm just going to use this database instead of dropping it and recreating it, is the idea that we can compress varchar max. If I said to you that, hey, you can compress varchar max, most of you would probably go, all oh, you've lost your mind. I, I know you're a compression guy, but you're crazy. And what I want to do is prove it out to you, because this is where the allocation units and understanding the way our data is allocated really starts to matter. So if I do a loop of about 5,000 rows, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a lot of data within my varchar max, just so that way I've got about 4,200. Uh, 4,024 uh, rows of data in each one of them. And then I come down here and I look at my data. Remember, Varchar Max, everything is still sitting on in-row data pages. So if I do an SP space used, I alter it, I rebuild this table with page compression, and another SP space used, you can see I take this table from about 39 megabytes, and I reduce it down to 336 kilobytes. Well, this is great because a lot of times when you work with developers and you say, how big does the field need to be? What do you get? I don't know. Uh, let's just make it a varchar max. We'll enforce the length in our application, right? Because th this way we've got the room. Every single time I've got to extend the field or if somebody has a, a crazy last name, the, kind of hyphens in it. I, I don't want to have to sit there and extend the last name field over and over and over again. We thought 50 was okay, but we needed 120. Well, we thought 120 was okay, but we found out we need 320. Well, we'll just make it a varchar max. It'll be fine. So what we can do is let's take a look at what happens if we were to compress a varchar max and we don't have any size limitation on it. What we'll do is we're going to take my data to, we're going to replicate it up to 8,000 bytes. And this should push us off of our in-row data page. And we'll take a look at the space used on our compressed table before and after. 336 bytes before, 40 megs after. Now remember, we're still compressed. So the overhead for compression is CPU utilization because we have to translate the compressed pages from the storage engine to the relational engine. Relational engine doesn't know compression even happens. They are uncompressed by the time they get back to the relational engine. So in this particular case, we're now taking the CPU overhead for compression, but we're really not getting any benefit out of it. As a matter of fact, our table is larger than when we started with it. And if I take a look at the allocation units one more time for this table, I can see that the majority of my data is now sitting in log data pages instead of my in-row data pages. So this is a very important concept, especially when it comes to compression. Um, 
just because there's a lot of times that I see people apply this across the board and things are going great and then all of a sudden there's a performance change and people wonder why. Understanding your allocation units, especially when utilizing compression, is a big reason why that can happen. So we've covered the entire stack. We've gone from records, pages, extents, to allocation bitmaps, to IAM chains and allocation units. One of the things that you should have right now is a pretty good understanding of how these relate, how our data is actually stored. If you go back to the very first slide on the first day, when we took a look at the database, and you think about day one as a DBA, what do you get? Here's a database with tables in it, and you learn about indexes slowly and views. Understanding the internal makeup that it actually comprises your database is going to help you a lot going forward. This is a very fundamental skill that all DBAs have to have. There's a couple other important concepts that we need to make sure and cover. ACID, transaction isolation levels, and latches, buffer and non-buffer. Transaction isolation levels are really important because these give us really secondaries for always on. Uh, in Hecaton, we're going to utilize uh, serializable and snapshot isolation very, very heavily uh, because the version store utilizes these to be able to keep a consistent transaction, uh, a consistent view of our transactions while at the same time not using a latch structure. We'll get in that in just a moment. First, let's talk about ACID. ACID is automicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. It is the fundamental properties of a database engine. It's not the fun kind of ACID, but it did come out of college. Uh, some guys wrote an academic white paper. I believe one of them was Jim Gray, uh, who used to be a former Microsoftian, really is, is one of the foundational thought leaders in what has made SQL Server what it is today. Atom Atomicity says that every single transaction in my database is an atomic unit of work. Either all of the transaction commits or none of it does. If your transaction fails, if your query fails, what happens? It rolls back. That's automicity. And we want it that way. If I'm doing multiple statements within a store procedure, I, I don't want just a little bit of it committing. Consistency. Consistency says that all the rules and check constraints and non-clustered indexes dependent upon my base object must be in a consistent state before a transaction can be finished. And this is very, very important because when we have locking, blocking, or even latch contention, a lot of the time it's because we have to make sure our objects are in a consistent state before another transaction or another portion of our own transaction can begin utilizing those objects again. Isolation. Even though my server is very, very busy, I want all of my transactions to act as if they are the only thing on that server. I can't have multiple statements within my store procedure that are part of one unique transaction allow somebody else to come in and change the data in the middle of my transaction. I need my transactions to operate as if they're the only thing going on. And durability. Durability gets right to the heart of write-ahead logging, what we covered on the first day. And the fact that as we do an insert, update, or delete any modification of a record is first persisted to our transaction log. Before, um, bef so that way we can do redo and undo as part of our recovery process. This is so if the checkpoint operation doesn't flush our dirty pages out of memory and somebody comes by and trips over the power cord, we don't lose our data right away. If I've got a savings account and I've got $1,000 in it, and we're going on vacation, and I want to take 500 out and put it on my checking account, and somebody trips over the cord in the power center, I can't have the bank just go, well, that transaction's done. He loses the 500 bucks. Nope. I need it either to roll back or roll forward. If that was a committed transaction that was sitting in memory, when that server comes back up, I need the transaction log to read that record forward, so either I have $1,000 in savings, or I have $500 in each one of my accounts. When we look at latches, latches start to get a little bit complex. And the time that we've got left, I'm going to try and go through them as quick as I possibly can. When you think about locking, locking has different types of modes. Latches have different types of mode as well. They have KP latches, 
which is a keep latch, very lightweight, and you shouldn't really ever see this. This is normally something that just goes in and checks to see that the data is actually sitting there in memory. A shared latch is whenever a latch is trying to read an object. And shared latches, as you can see, are compatible with keep latches, shared latches, and update latches. An update latch is just like an update operation. We are updating something and we need an update latch on it. An exclusive latch is going to be for an insert or a modification. Remember, an update is a bit of a hybrid. It will take a shared latch to be able to scan and find the data, and then it will take an exclusive latch as it makes its data operation. An exclusive latch could also be for an insert or delete operation. And then a DT latch, once again, you shouldn't really see these unless you're having really, really bad memory contention. This is when we're destroying a buffered object out of memory, so that way we can make room to read a new buffer object in place. Bob Ward is, is master of presentations at the PASS Summit. I, I can't think of a PASS Summit that I go to where one of the top things on my list is not seeing what Bob Ward has to say. In 2010, he did a presentation on latches that did one of the best jobs of explaining what a latch does within SQL Server. For this example, we're going to say we've got page 100 in our database. The M free data, which we covered when we were looking at pages, tells us the next ordinal position on our page where we would write data to. So you can see in this case we're pointing to slot or to space 126, and we already have two slots on the page that are taken up and using data for record 1100 and 2200. So we want to insert record 3300. We need to take an exclusive page lock on page 1100. More very busy server, we want to come down here, and we also need to take an exclusive page lock on our page again because we're going to insert record 4400. In a world without latches, what would happen is that page or data 3300 would be written in, and then 4400 would be written in because we have nothing to tell record 4400 as part of that lock to go anywhere else. So what happens in our world is we'll acquire an exclusive latch for this transaction. And our other latch will attempt to acquire an exclusive latch, but it will be blocked, generating an EX latch wait stat. Record 3300 will be inserted. We will update our slot array, pointing at the next ordinal position, or pointing at the position for where that data can be referenced. We update our M free data, which points to the next ordinal position of where that data will be inserted. We release this latch because this transaction is now finished, and we allow this latch to acquire and the transaction to proceed. And now we update our slot array, our M free data, and 4400 is in its proper place. So without latches, we wouldn't be able to actually protect our pages from just locking operations. A latch is a metadata operation, so that way we can update our pages before the next operation occurs. Now there's a couple different types of latches, and doing a full deep dive on latches is outside of the scope of what we can cover in the time remaining. But there's buffer latches and non-buffer latches. Two of the buffer latches that you will see often in your wait stats are page IO latches, and the XX will be either a shared, an update, or an exclusive. And and this occurs when we're waiting for data to be buffered that is part of an IO process. You can also see a page latch wait that occurs when you're attempting to acquire a latch that is not part of an IO process. And then you can also see a latch underscore wait like we saw on a previous example for exclusive update or shared latches as well. To cover a little bit more on the internals and the way a query works, I, I like to show this as often as I can to people because I think it's important for us to have a good idea of what all the different components are within SQL Server. For SQL 2012 on down, this is going to actually hold very, very true. Uh, SQL 2014, well, we'll get to that in a minute. So we're going to do a select operation real quick. Our user is going to write a query, and the first thing it's going to do is it's going to go through the SQL network interface. The SQL network interface is um, are the items that you see your SQL native client in um, the SQL server. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking the, uh, the manager window where you look at your networking protocols. Um, and uh, you, so TCP IP, SQL native client, uh, 
via in 2008 R2 on down, uh, the way that you actually communicate to your SQL Server. That's what the SNI is. It's the first components that we come to uh, in the SQL Server Configuration Manager. The SQL Network Interface will then turn our query into a tabular data stream, which is proprietary to Microsoft, uh, but kind of a throwback to the old Sybase days, and we'll hit the command parser. The command parser, if you've ever gotten that nice red X on a query before, uh, that's what occurs when your syntax is not correct, or if you try and select all from a stored proc, uh, can't select from a stored proc, you've got to be able to bind the statement to an object. The command parser is what will kick it out. In this case, we'll say that we parse our command and it succeeds. We'll check the plan cache to see if we have a query plan. In this case, we're going to say we don't. We go over to the optimizer, uh, and magic happens, and we have a query plan. Now, uh, there are full day events that, uh, that we teach on how the optimizer works. Uh, a lot of different components to it. But we'll just say for the sake of time, our query goes in, it's optimized. We get a plan, and we come out to our SQL query executor. The executor will then take our query and pass it off to the access methods. The access methods is the fundamental place within the storage engine that knows where all the indexes and data is stored. So it knows exactly where to go to be able to find the data within our query. The access methods will go to the buffer manager and say, hey, I need this data. The buffer manager will check the data cache to see if the data is in there. We're going to say it's not. So we'll go out to the physical data on disk. We will then buffer it within our data cache, and we have our data. Buffer manager gives it back to the access methods, goes back to the query executor, back to the SQL network interface, and back to the user. And of course, the SQL OS manages the memory utilization, and th threads, and the schedulers for this entire process. When we start looking at an update, the things are mostly the same, but we change a little bit. We're going to go through our SQL network interface. We'll still check the plan cache. We'll get optimized. We get an executor. But at the access methods, we split because of write-ahead logging. And we go to our transaction manager. Now, technically, we're going to use the transaction manager on a select statement as well because we'll get shared locks on data. Uh, but it's a lot more pronounced when we do our write-ahead logging because we're going to have to take exclusive locks and we're actually going to have to use the transaction manager to write out to the transaction log. In this case, we will write ahead to the transaction log. In this case, we'll say our data is already in our buffers. We will update our pages, and these are dirty pages. We come back, and we let our user know that our command was successful. Notice that not once do we touch the data file because everything is an in-memory operation. And of course, the SQL OS once again manages all of this. So why does this matter? Well, when it comes to in-memory OLTP, Hecton is completely integrated within the SQL Server engine. We have, when we go to the SQL network interface, if we use a natively compiled stored proc, this will be stored in memory and can only access in-memory data. However, we can also go and we can parse our regular T-SQL commands and use query interop to be able to access memory optimized tables as well. We also, on an update, can have a non-durable hecaton table where we do not log the operations associated with it. So a lot of things change, but a lot of what revolves around hecaton is the ability for us to be able to skip our latches. So this demo that I have for you, I'm running SQL Server 2014 on a VM. And because I'm a VTSP with Microsoft, um, I have access to this particular demo. What I want to do is show it to you. I've got a ticket reservation database for this application. And this is essentially just a ticket reservation system that uh, will take reservations for people as they're planning airlines and perhaps changing flights. So we've got a lot of details that we've got to track for them. Uh, this is a laptop with about 8 gigabytes of RAM. And if I take a look at my VM, uh, I've got four logical CPUs presented to it. And I've got about 8 gigs of data right now. I'm using about 5. What I'm going to do is I'm also going to track my CPU utilization, and I'm going to track my latches as well. Now, 
This is the only demo I have that I can't give away to you. For, so everything else is available on the website to download, um, but I, I cannot give away this. This is proprietary to Microsoft. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my application, and I'm going to show the number of transactions I can get per second on this reservation system. So you can see I've got a high number of latches. I've got about 60% CPU utilization. It's a pretty busy system. And I'm averaging between, on the low end, the high 200s, up to almost 400 transactions per second. This isn't bad. This isn't bad at all. But I think we could do a little bit better. So what we're going to do is I'm going to stop this, and I'm going to migrate my table that I'm using, my ticket reservation detail. A management data warehouse gets a bit of an upgrade in SQL Server 2014. One of the things I can do is I can actually take a look at my transaction performance analysis overview. And I can see when I look at my ticket reservation details table that my ticket, res I'm sorry, that my ticket reservations database, that my ticket reservation detail table will actually take minimal work to migrate over to Hekton and I'll have high gain. None of my other tables are going to migrate nearly as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire off a script that's going to migrate my table over to an in-memory OLTP object. I'm not changing the T-SQL that accesses it at all, just the physical structure, and I'm porting the data over. Now, I go ahead and I fire this back up, and immediately I can see that I get a pretty big jump. I go from about 400 transactions a second up to 1,200, about 3x performance gain. The goal of Hecaton was to get about 100 times performance gain, and obviously we, we didn't get that high, but th this is pretty good. You can also see, though, that my CPU utilization is just going through the roof. I'm at about 100% because I'm pushing this a lot harder than I was previously. So let's go ahead and stop this, because one of the big things that we get from natively compiled stored products is they're compiled DLLs. They get recompiled every single time you start up SQL Server. Uh, the DLLs will exist in root directories, but it's compiled code, so if someone goes in there and tries to hack them and edit them, it can't introduce uh, poor behavior. Uh, they will get recompiled every time SQL Server starts up, and the compiled code is all that's going to run. But this also gives us a lot fewer instruction sets for CPU. It will make our CPU utilization much more efficient. So if I migrate my stored proc to a natively compiled stored proc, and, and then I fire off my transactions again, I can see that off of that, I got about a four to five times, six times improvement. I'm getting close to 2,000 transactions per second, which is really not bad considering I started out at around 400 transactions per second. So you can see sitting here on a laptop, on a VM, I've already been able to take this application and introduce a lot better behavior just by utilizing Hecaton or in-memory OLTP. So, this is definitely a technology as we look at the internals of SQL Server that we want to keep a, a look at. The concurrent version store allows us not to take latches, which is part of the big problem holding us back and being able to get higher transaction throughput for SQL Server. So this is a really, really great technology. I'm excited for this to get re uh, released very soon, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next version, which should have even more utilization. So once again, resources, slide deck and demos are, are up and online. I added a little bit with the latch contention today, but all the demos are exactly the same. I think I only added one slide. I also added a reference to Bob Ward. Oh, I forgot to finish filling that out. But Bob has several presentations that he does on inside latches. I've got a link to Paul Randall in the MCM video series that I showed earlier, his blog on anatomy to a page. Merrill Aldridge has a, a great tool SQL File Layout Viewer, which allows you to see the way your database is laid out internally, types of pages and files. And, and then this is the, um, the blog series that I put together about how to be able to read an internal record.